Um, so yeah, so this little thing here is called the four points and it, I don't mean that name seriously. I had to name it. It's just a way that I work and it's not that any of this is necessarily original. It's just, I've sort of built all these little tools or cobbled together and sort of built a bunch of concepts, frameworks and tools around this stuff. Uh, if you're not familiar to me, I'm pretty sarcastic at times. And so as I go through this, I, this is just, this is how I work. You know, I'm not here to like, I don't, don't trademark all this stuff. It's not trying to be, uh, like highfalutin and like the Simon Sinek circles stuff. Uh, it's just, it's just how I work. So, uh, what I'll do is I'll explain it, show you examples, and then we'll try to apply it. And like I said, I'm going to need a couple of people that I can interact directly with because it's, it's going to be difficult to sort of do it with 20 to 25 people, but within about 20 minutes, we're hopefully going to come up with a strategy to solve some kind of, it could be, I'd like to do this comedically, but solve some kind of problem, uh, to do with coronavirus in Canada. All right. So this thing, problem inside advantage strategy, here's what the, whoop, I had definition somewhere here for you. What did I do with that slide? Duh, duh, duh. Sorry. So this is like jargon upon jargon, but uh, I've, especially having grown up doing digital work, I've often not had much time to work on things and even having to turn creative briefs around or being the person as like a head of strategy at some large and then independent agencies in New York, I'd get hauled into rooms with very little notice with 30 people sitting there sometimes and the people are like, you're running this workshop. And I'm like, oh my God. So I had to like cobble these basically survival tools together. And this is the these four things are what I try to encourage upcoming strategists to do. You can have whatever techniques you want. You can have the three C's, four C's, five C's, whatever frameworks work. What I do is, and what this assumes is a business issue. We'll be talking about a social issue. If we go into something such as why people aren't washing their hands, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, and it also assumes an audience. And then what I'm looking for here is problem. What's the human problem behind the business problem? So most briefs come in and it's, the, you know, I've audited some of, the companies you all work with and not what it is that's a strong word but looked at a lot of creative briefs a lot of marketing briefs and most marketing briefs are copy and paste from the last marketing brief and i know that because i make that joke in front of marketers and they all nod and for some reason marketing briefs aren't brief they're five pages ten pages plus slides and people are paranoid about leaving things out i know that because i've redesigned marketing briefs and everyone's just petrified about not being able to show all their work because that's how they get approval internally um, so human problem behind the business problem, some kind of obstacle or barrier in people's minds that pre that's preventing them from doing something inside an unspoken human truth that shares new light on the problem. So the way I work, I'm, I'm looking for a theme to kind of come through in the problem definition. And then the insight will keep that theme alive and flip it. And often using similar language advantage, uh, or edge, you know, what makes your thing, your brand, your product, you, the social issue. Uh, unique and motivating in people's minds, it's like conventional language and uh, strategy exclamation mark, a new way of seeing your thing based on all that. So the strategy tries to solve the problem by putting the insight and advantage together. Uh, it's also trying to cure for things like the four C's where people just put dribble in them. And when you start doing strategy, but some of these frameworks, when you see them filled in, especially by people older than you are really intimidating. You're like, Oh my God, I want to do that job one day, but I don't know if I could ever do it. And after time, you're like, oh my God, most of these are really similar. <clears throat> and you get dribble like uh, cultural truth, consumer truth, mums are busy. It's kind of a cultural truth, cultural truth. People have attention spans of six seconds, company truth, you know, innovating the powerful optimization of holistic synergistic enterprises and uh, category truth. It's a sea of sameness. It's always a sea of sameness. Um, and so these frameworks don't, there's no theme in them. They're not doing anything. And usually in the middle of a four C's type of thing like that, there's like these crazy long adjectives and, uh, adverbs like deliciously nutritious and nutritiously, nutritiously delicious. So just trying to get that stuff away and actually get to, um, interesting thinking. So this is a quick example for Drambui. Drambui is a drink in Scotland. This is pretty tongue in cheek. And I did, I did this as a response to a, a pretty clear headed one page marketing brief for a podcast in Australia called son of a pitch. And the brief that they gave me because they give every, the guests a, a brief to respond to was that young people aren't drinking Drambui because older people are drinking it. Usually, you know, like I've heard that brief before because I've worked on Levi's in the 1990s and people back then, younger people weren't wearing Levi's because their parents wore them. And so when I hear a problem statement like that, and I've heard it before, 
I'm like, oh, I should really dig into that. The thing is that a little idea popped into my head as, as I was riffing on this idea. So, uh, you know, trying to get younger people to drink Drambuie, what I said is like, uh, so problem here is Drambuie is what old people drink. And then this is a joke and it's made up, but I imagine these people that a lot of us know and we see them in high school, we might go to university or college with them and then they hit 25 and they look 69. They're always like really mature, uh, a lot of golf, but like, well, like dressed up golf, not like Florida uh, flip-flop golf or thongs. You say thongs or flip-flops. And, uh, you know, driving nice cars, talking about property prices, just too old, too young, right? And so that was the audience that we settled on. I feel like there's an insight here that opens up this problem that Drambuie drinkers believe that acting old, so I'm using the word old again, makes good old people things happen. So it's a bit silly, it's a bit of fun, but I'm essentially saying that those people who act old at that age, they think that that's going to bring all the good stuff from being old to them now. Uh, and the funny thing is you look into the history of Drambuie and it was the recipe came from this guy who was like 26 leading armies in Scotland and he fled to the McKinnon clan and they called him the young pretender and so on and so forth. But I loved it because within a few seconds, I was like, oh, I can actually make an argument for this Drambuie. Um, I've got your faces all over my slides here, so I'm not sure what I, I can't see half the words. But um, what is it? Drambuie has um, been young since, has been old since it was born or since it was young right and then a strategy statement and i like a strategy statement to come before a key message or a single minor proposition this one here is we'll show that drambui makes the best of aging happen sooner and that that sentence is an idea most of these sentences house ideas because ideas bring two things or more together that don't usually belong together drambui best of aging happen happening or happening yeah best of aging happening sooner those two things put them together that's an, that's an idea it's not a campaign idea it's not a platform it's not a social media idea but that is a sentence it has the mechanics of an idea um i'll show you a quick, a quick one and then we'll get into it uh i was kicking some stuff around for someone with a friend in australia that i used to work with who's pitching something to the government this week and I know there's a stereotype in here, but basically what he's got, he's creating this digital service slash product. And the problem that they, they want to solve is like Australians aren't taking uh, coronavirus seriously. And again, you could play around with the, the problem there and go, well, why aren't they? And do the five whys and various other techniques. But I allowed that serious or seriously theme to stick because I've got strong thoughts about Australians and seriousness. A little bit made up and it's a bit fun, but I, I think it is true uh, and slightly stereotypical. But the insight here is that Aussies are world champions of not taking things seriously. But we try to be world champions of the few things we do take seriously. It's a bit riddle, a bit of a riddle, that one. But uh, part of our culture, at least for me growing up, was like if you took something seriously, you could get targeted. So a lot of our culture is quite sarcastic and, you know, we don't want people to think we, we think that we're good or that we think that we're smart. And so it's just this whole game. Uh, and yet at the same time, you know, not having the Olympics this year will hurt Australia. I hardly ever hear about it in America. Uh, it's big in some parts, but I hardly ever hear about it. In Australia, we hear about it all the time. Uh, now the product doesn't have a name, it doesn't have features, but you can see the advantage there. And then this strategy sentence is like, show Aussies they could become world beaters of the one thing to take seriously. It's a bit awkward, it needs work, but essentially we're saying that this product could help Australians. You know, if you're going to take, it's basically saying, we know you don't take things seriously, but when you do, you're the best. <laughs> Here's a little thing worth taking seriously. You're going to be the best at it. That's essentially what's going on here. Uh, there's a couple of rude words on this one, and then I'll get into the exercise. This is a little bit different. I wanted to take the idea of serious and ser seriousness and play with it again. Australian friendships play chicken with what to take seriously. So this product's actually going to help friends like <laughs> stay away from each other. Uh, and without kind of going through all the words there, because it's a bit busy, the strategy for this one is, is a slightly different take on serious. And it's saying that if you know, okay, you don't have to take your friends seriously all the time, but in this situation, you might as well because you get to take the piss out of them for longer. You get to put them down and, and whatnot, which again is a big part of the, the Australian culture. So anyway, there's, there's the quick examples. Um, and I work a lot like that on pieces of paper. And I, when I was in agencies, I would share them with people before a creative brief even happened. I, I found when I managed a lot of younger strategists, people rushed into the creative brief. And I'm like, just tell me, I don't want, I don't want, when I see you standing there <laughs> red eyed with a creative brief, you're not looking to actually interact. You just want validation. So I was like, show me the drawings, write those stories. 
All right, so that's the rubric we're going to play with. Do I have a volunteer or two who can help me? Come on now, guys. Do not be shy. We've got one volunteer, so um, Saad is going to volunteer. S say hello, Saad. Introduce yourself. Hello. And we have Sharon as well. Sharon, while we wait on Saad, please, um, please introduce yourself to everybody. Um, I think I was, on mute. I was on mute, introducing myself to myself. Uh, um, I'm Saad, I work at PhD uh, on uh, strategy type stuff. Lovely stuff. Awesome. Such a vague strategy type stuff, but that's totally fine. Yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Love it. <All> right. <laughs> and then Sharon as well. Does everybody know what Sharon's nickname would be in Australia? Shazza. Shazza. <laughs> Hopefully. Did, you, did you know that? Did you know no, that? I know that it would be Shaz in the UK, but Shazza, like it. Shaz, Shazza, yeah. All right. So what I need, so both of you have your microphones on. We'll try to do this really quickly. Give me a business or a social issue that we can solve with a bit of comedy. Let's start with something to do with coronavirus. Some of you might've seen the UN who kind of created brief floating around recently. Is this something we can play with here? Um, I, I want to say there's a ton of uncertainty around small businesses. Um, Maybe there's there's something there. Okay. So what's the okay? All right. Uh, who's the audience, and what do we need them to do? Is this about government supporting small businesses? Is it about people supporting small business? It could be silly uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I, w I would say so. As a planner, I think one thing I've noticed is a lot of my clients um, are having a hard time planning. So as, as an entrepreneur, as a small business owner, uh, I think there's some, maybe some comedy in that um, uncertainty. Okay. So the audience would be clients running small businesses? Yeah, sure who are too uncertain to plan anything and that you're basically you're selling them the idea of planning some stuff right so you're the product or the okay got it all right so this is from the agency's perspective that the agency or someone agency like is working with people and they're too uncertain to do anything yeah yeah. Okay. So then what we'll do is I'll try to list say about seven of these and let's see where we go. Obviously try to keep the language simple, no jargon, uh, problem behind the problem. Why, uh, why are small businesses too uncertain to plan anything? Just don't just state I'll type them. Sure. Um, it's hard to predict what's going to happen next week and next month. Um, they're depending on the sector that you're working in. So if you're in travel, restaurants, um, you're probably really hard hit. People are changing the way they behave. Um, so we're seeing, um, we're, we're seeing people isolate themselves. So what does that mean for things like media habits um, and how do businesses respond to um, people not interacting in person with each other? Okay. Um, what I'm going to do just for the sake of time, and I, I do this because I like to, it's a bit of fun. Okay. So I don't know if we're going to get anywhere incredible, but I'm, I feel like the word unclear is just, a, you know, we could play with the word uncertain. I like unclear. And so I'm going to grab that. Um, I'm going to stay the problem as clients are too unclear about um, the future to do anything in the present, right? It's a little bit corny and I'll, I'll dump these problems down and I'm trying to keep in mind that you folk are potentially trying to get people to do some stuff, right? So 
insight, unspoken human truth that sheds new light on the problem. Here, we're going to riff on the word unclear. So it's as if the first paragraph of our essay, like clients are too unclear about the futures to do anything in the present. And you proof, 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 proof. But here's the thing. So can we, I know this is, can be difficult. Um, drawing it out just to, just to give you some time. Uh, I want to riff on the idea of unclear. And one, I mean, I don't know how many of you write creative briefs. I'm assuming most of you do. Um, and you're probably experts at it. So again, I don't ever try to patronize. It's a bit of fun. Uh, there are many structures such as one phrase and then the word but and then another phrase. Or you could replace the word but with words like despite, however, nevertheless, whereas, meanwhile, right? And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get one phrase with a turning word in the middle and another phrase. And again, that's the structure of an idea. It's two things that don't usually belong together. So perhaps, I don't know if anything's coming to your mind as I babble on, but one way to try to get into this would be, look, if you had a really deep and meaningful conversation with your client about clarity or a lack of clarity, and you're trying to relate it to them and their businesses and how they've usually done things, that's probably, that could unlock where we might go with this. Um, and I can ask more specific questions as well. Are there any thoughts coming to mind? Insights to do with clarity? Uh, this question. is this is the part that I struggle with the most, uh, the insight, getting to the insight. Um, sometimes it's like that, so, uh, and usually it's not. It's like when you're doing the dishes. Yeah, and we're not we're not using research here either. So this is going to come from intuition. I I can sense aphorisms and cliches coming through my head. So, you know, I I think that the thing with business is like you're never really clear about the future, uh, yet you still do things to make it happen. That, so I'm going to write that down. It's a bit corny, but I'm going to get these words out. Um, freeze them or stop them from doing, like stop them from um, planning or acting. Right. So I would usually write a few of these and even, like I said, this is not coming from research, but um, I, I'm okay to start a bit corny. I, you will notice for what it's worth. Uh, I don't use long words where possible. And it's not that this is good writing, but we're stumbling in public to something here. Right. So essentially you can have a problem where clients are too unclear about the future to do anything in the present. So they're frozen. So if you're presenting to a client or you're presenting maybe actually presenting internally about what the agency or what you need to do for the clients. But the first slide could just be the word frozen and it could be a, uh, I know it's a little bit obvious. It's just what's coming out um, an iceberg because, you know, you can have an iceberg blocking the future. So you get to hit it, <laughs> hit the metaphor a couple of times, which can actually lead to unclear communication. So clients are too unclear about the futures to do anything in the present. But what's funny about that is like, you're never really clear about the future and that hasn't frozen you before, right? So that's how those two sentences can play with each other. Um, have a think and I'll spend another 30 seconds on the inside. Otherwise I'm just going to move through. Ma, uh, quick yeah. I, I, just, I get that rigor mortis comes to mind for me. So pe people just stopping and not being able to do anything. Yeah. So. yeah. And then what, what's something about that? So that's like, a nice visual. So we've got frozen for the problem or rig. Uh, I'm not going to spell it right correctly, am I? That's Is that it? Yeah. Uh, Mark, so then I, I, sorry, I had one thought or question, I guess, to this. So what role does context play when you're building at this insight? Because I'm thinking if you're a small business owner, you know, we've gone through this incredible sort of boom period where everything's been great. So you know, clarity or certainty isn't as important, but now in this particular time, when, you know, it's the Warren Buffett quote, when the tide goes out, you see who's not wearing any swim trunks kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. now is the time when that uncertainty is more important, right? So is there something in that contextual dynamic of we're now in this period of tremendous uncertainty and you need it more than ever before you didn't need it because, you know, we were in this rising market and everything was booming, everything was great. So, so what's the, the yeah, so, me, so I thought I would throw that, throw that out. Yeah, for sure. So let, let me try to get it in a short sentence. Uh, what's Give it to me again. So we need uncertainty more but than But when ever. things were great, previously, 
I, I, you know, a small business owner wouldn't focus on that need for the clarity and certainty because everything was rising. Now everything's falling. I have this new hypersensitivity to it where I'm more attuned to making the wrong decisions. Whereas before any decision I made you know, could have been successful it's because every, all boats are rising, right? It's a bit like the investing analogy. So when the markets are rising, yeah. every decision seems great because the markets are going up. But when the markets are going down, that's when professional decision making needs to come into play. Something like that. Okay. All right. Uh, any other any other thoughts on this? So like the the problem statement I'd write ten to twenty times, and this stuff would be in my head because I would have done you know. 30 to 40 interviews with people at the very least and we would have research uh, and then the insight I'd write multiple multiple times but I'd keep coming back to well, key words so I'm going to keep coming back to that word clear and if I get bored with that if I think it's weak if I don't think it's there's electricity in it I'll find a word that's that's sharper and if I really get stuck I go into visual metaphor like you know I know icebergs a bit obvious but like I, an iceberg like, like your your eyes are glued to an iceberg I just make it a bit sillier and see what I would come with uh, See, see what would happen there. So any other thoughts on insight from anyone? Um, I was just thinking about what, uh, to Chris's point, um, periods of contraction usually make things clearer for businesses. So businesses when, you know, things are good, kind of expand and go different directions. Whereas when things contract, they tend to focus on their core business. I like that. Is, There's also, I think, uh, something with the audience, just knowing that, you know, it's small business owners and these are people that are more comfortable with uncertainty to begin with. They mm -hmm. took a leap of faith and, uh, you know, they, they are betting on themselves. Ambiguity acceptance. Hmm. Yeah, and I know this is going to be a bit convenient and it's just in the interest of time, but essentially what we're saying, okay, you know, you, that's why I was asking, you know, what would you say to a client if you had a couple of drinks in a, in a pub and they're just like, I really don't know what to do. I just, I, and the talk back to that is like, did you ever really know what to do? Like you worked it out by doing stuff. You didn't work it out by not doing anything. Remember that person? Remember that person? We need that person now. That's essentially the, the argument that's forming through some of these thoughts here, right? Um, I th think cause my head was already working on that first one. I'm going to just play with that one. Uh, they will sort of support each other, but then what is, what's the advantage here? The thing, the weird thing with doing stuff, stuff like this is like, we're not talking about a product and we, we've got to work out what we are talking about. I guess what we're talking about is, uh, doing some kind of planning with you, with the agency. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah. Uh, so then if we're talking about clarity and clarity, what's your argument about what you can, yeah, yeah, it is what you can do, right? Yeah. What's your argument about the kind of planning that you could do for the agency using the word clarity and using short words? So I'll give you an example. Thanks for all your suggestions there. <laughs> uh, it's funny. So in, in this little book thing I've got, I've, I've sort of written about a lot of the words I've heard from strategists over the years and clarity is one of them, writing a clear, uh, clear creative brief or clear thinking, feeling clear. And the thing is, as you all know, you're not clear until you say you are and you're in a fog until you're not clear. And then you might think that you're clear. You share, like I am, words with other people and they might say, yeah, I don't get it. And you're like, oh, I thought I'd cracked it. And now your clarity is going to survive, not just your head, but other people's heads. And then it's going to stay clear on throughout the project. And so the idea of clarity, I think is funny because it's clarities that you need and you constantly need them on any kind of project. And I think the thought that I'm trying to connect into here is something to do with, um, 
I'd probably use like, I know we're using, we've said frozen rigor mortis, uh, I was thinking of the word fog before, but essentially what you could say is like, uh, you know, planning with us always starts uh, yeah, yeah, in the fog and ends. Just bear with me. This is not going to be the, let's see. Let's see if you like this. Planning with us always starts in the fog, but ends clear. I mean, you, you want your reasons to believe, you know, so if you've got a, a certain process where you're like, we find all the data and we find all the, all the signals and we just show you how messy it is. And then we gradually create new, uh, combinations of things, new connections that lead to new insight, new wisdom, you know, so the advantage is to be a, a clear sentence that would support your reasons to believe. And then the strategy sentence, which um, let's see, we might actually just repeat some language so we can get through it quickly. Show that planning with us is, so let me jump back up, we've got clients are too unclear. So let me repeat. We've got a business issue or social slash business issue that the future of small business is uncertain. We have an audience, an agency audience where clients running small businesses or businesses are too uncertain to plan anything. So they're sitting on their hands, maybe freaking out. Um, okay, we slightly shifted that. The, the problem is the clients are too unclear about the future to do anything in the present. So they're not. And then this insight here, businesses are never really clear about the future, but that doesn't usually freeze them. Doesn't you didn't stop, but it didn't stop them before. Okay. And then we've got this advantage of, uh, is this holding together? Is everyone okay? Everyone's doing okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's really, I want action and clarity to somehow come together to solve this. So uh, strategy show that planning with us is oh, so corny. The first act to get clear or that's essentially what we're saying. It's just corny and we would want to come up with things that are more provocative. Um, show that planning with us is that I'm going to write that down and you know, for those of you who are writers, you know that the first words out aren't always the ones that end up in public and you would rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Show that planning with us is the first step to, uh, to clarity, okay? It's not amazing, but I just wanted to show you a relatively quick way of doing it. This stuff's really hard if you've got a room of 40 people, uh, people who want to be there, people who don't. But essentially what, we're, what I'm just trying to show here is within four sentences, within four sentences, you've got your scaffolding for a creative brief and for a presentation. And you might have hand drawn all this sort of stuff and you can get people to fingerprints on it and go, they might say, Oh, that sentence isn't very strong. I've heard that before. It's cliche it's familiar. And then you go back and forth before it becomes this official document. And so that's, that's the way I've, I always like to work. Although we all have different operating um, ways of operating. I operate in a very informal way, casual, informal, one-on-one -on -one, slight introversion, unless I'm in front of a lot of people, other people like to be official and formal and they're great at politicking and I suck at it. And then I, I'm not sure what your point of view uh, on comms, like uh, communications plan is here, but just as by way of example, and Saad, you're at PhD, is that right? Yes. All right. So you must be an expert on this sort of stuff. So what, uh, obviously you have some kind of path to purchase or some sort of way of planning the communication. So it's not just one piece of communication that gets chopped up and put, gets put in lots of different uh, channels and one of the things that I don't see a lot of, at least in New York, and I've got I've got friends who who run PhD and and various media agencies. And what I hear in New York is that there's just so much money and scale that there's not a lot. I I don't mean this in a mean way. There's not always uh, the maverick creative brains in the media agencies that I used to compete with back home. A lot of whom went through agencies like Naked, which were really creative with communications planning and people like Faris Yako. I mean, there's so many people who, who are still around in the world doing amazing things. And a lot of them came through this, this Naked uh, school. Uh, and what we would do there is really just try to work out I don't know what the campaign idea for this is, but if the idea is clarity, we would list. Let's do the side. Could you do this for me? Could you list um, three, three channels where clarity isn't? So, okay, hang on. Three channels where a client would seek clarity. 
where they would see clarity yeah what a, what a three chat um so I'm, what i'm trying to do is get some of this campaign that would have something to do with clarity to connect to channels in a way where the idea affects the channel selection and how the idea turns up so that uh, one of the examples that I've run through a lot is this thing with the New York Knicks. And one of the themes in the strategy is anger or anger management. And the strategy sentence or statement is that, that we want to show that the New York Knicks are the best anger management in town. That could lead to a single minor proposition such as the New York Knicks cure New York anger. And then part of the media plan, I would encourage it to turn up in places that are really angry. Not all of it, but not all of the media plan, but some of it. So where are some places that we could turn up where people are either unclear, seeking clarity or feeling clear? Oh, interesting. So I was thinking of the opposite of that, which is places that are busy and sort of um, crowded and where you would seek clarity. So I'm thinking of like, go financial post and you see all these tickers going by and tons of headlines and if you're a small business owner, you're, you're looking at all of that information and I imagine it's giving you low level anxiety um, because it's a lot of information. Um, mm -hmm. um, there I like that. I like that. Yeah. Couple more. I like where you go were going with that. So you're thinking of media that clarifies? Yeah, I mean, I would... I would... I mean, there's a little taxonomy here of three. So you go, where are people unclear? Where would they go to seek clarity? Where would they feel clear? And we're just brainstorming now. But I, I like the idea of news tickers. It's perfect because it's noisy. It's, it's probably confusing anxiety, uh, causing a lack of clarity and anxiety, as you said. And if you could advertise somewhere near one of those, so we don't know if that's possible. Uh, the other thing is you could kind of create one in an interesting space as well, uh, that the payoff would be, because this, we'd probably tighten up this strategy because what we're really trying to say is, you know, don't, don't forget that like you thrive on, on a lack of clarity or you thrive on uncertainty. That's why you started your business to begin with. And so I think that it'd be, it'd be a nice kind of message and needs some proper words, but it'd be a nice kind of message to be around these news tickers or places where clients are just overwhelmed. So that's cool. Uh, I, I'm going to stop it there. I don't, I don't know if that was useful. Like I never know if we're going to get somewhere good and usually you'd have a little bit of time to kick it around and write it out. But I just wanted to show how I love to work because it's, it's fun. And for what it's worth, again, I don't mean to patronize. Um, every project that I work on, one of the ways I've tried to stay sane is to treat them as, as, uh, as a part of like a creative practice. So if I'm writing a brief or a strategy story, these little one page things I do, I sometimes write them in different voices or I'll say, I'm going to fill this page with just one syllable words or two syllable words. I'm going to write it through the voice of this person I researched. So that voice really comes through and that stuff helps me feel really engaged with my work. And I, I focus on the words and I try to keep things simple. And you know, often it's just one page is what, like one of my key deliverables is like a page. <laughs> uh, and I, I know a lot of you work like that, but uh, it's sometimes, sometimes we don't share our toys because we're all competing with each other. And now I'm uh, supporting versus competing. So I get to share my toys. So that's all this is about. Any questions with that? Okay. <laughs> is everyone doing all right? Thank you. This is, this is super helpful. Um, I do have a question for you if there's time, um, but this was super helpful. Yeah, there's time. Um, yeah, I guess my question is, uh, it's sort of a general one. How do you know when you've landed on the insight? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's hard. So what's going on with that is a few things. Are you ready? <laughs> Oh, such a nerd. This must be painful. Okay. So I think it starts with the fact that to me, an insight is a kind of idea because ideas, I'm going to repeat myself, bring at least two things together in novel and useful ways. Okay. So an idea is a lateral thought. You can read Edward de Bono. Uh, if you're interested in exploring more about that, it's been written about for a very, very long time. And to me, understanding linear and lateral thinking as concepts are the foundations of what we do. You don't get to be an accountant without knowing debit and credit. I don't think we should be in our industry without knowing linear and lateral thinking. It's just, it's, it's mind blowing. And some of us learn it way late into our careers and we're like, oh my gosh, I should have known this day one or before. 
So an insight is an idea. So to answer your question, I'm looking for mechanics. Are there two things together that don't usually exist together? One of the quotes from research that I often use is when a gentleman said to me, I don't feel accomplished enough to be bald. Okay, baldness and accomplishment. They're two things that we don't usually associate together. That's written in first person. I'm not sure if it's, if it's an insight. Now, the difference between an insight as an idea is that when we hear an insight, we want to reorganize our lives. All right? We're like, oh, I really should change my behavior. So one thing, if you want to practice this stuff, is just a piece of paper every now and then and write something that you've learned about the world or yourself that's led you to change. Write it as a sentence uh, and then potentially write it as an insight. And then you can ruminate on like, what? Why did, why did I change my behavior because of that? And how did it feel? So I know there's a few words there, but it's, there's essentially what I'm looking for is mechanics. Is there an idea there that I haven't heard before? The I haven't heard before is subjectivity. It's me being subjectively, um, sorry, it's what researchers refer to as being psychologically new. So an insight could be historically new, new ever, or psychologically new, new to you. And so you could go to stand-up comedy and you could see, with a friend see a comedian and you might find a joke hilarious it's psychologically new to you and your friend's like i've seen that before which means it's not psychologically new to that person and it's um, not historically new so mechanics um the feelings and then usually when i drop in examples and i know we don't have one like that today but the boldness uh, i don't feel accomplished enough to be bald we usually um smile or snort or giggle and so I'm listening for those sounds. Uh, and then you've got to work out if the product's got anything to do with it and the brand's got anything to do with it and whether you can defend it. I absolutely disagree with the pressure that people are having placed on them right now. They have bulletproof insights and the idea of, you know, I have silly strategy jokes that I can throw at you if you're interested, but um, one of them is, I'm going to do it, is like um, when someone asks Okay, hang on, I've got to think of it. Uh, when someone asks you, is that a data-driven insight or did you make it up? The answer is yes. Most people who use that phrase don't know what they're talking about and they don't know the whole data, information, knowledge, wisdom, uh, hierarchy, and that essentially data is nothing until you make it something and then it's not data, it's information. And then as soon as we use information, it becomes knowledge and then more profound knowledge is wisdom. Um, so I know there's a, a, that was a very long and cumbersome answer, but mechanics and feelings, just focus there and sounds. And then you got to work out whether uh, the product or brand has anything going on. Um, yeah. Lovely stuff. Thank you. Uh, one, one question, Mark. Are there any common traps or pitfalls to avoid? I love the framework, but to, as you work through it. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is whatever works. So the, the main trap would be the two main traps with all the frameworks are that you fetishize them and they become dogmatic and, and holy. I think that's really dangerous. They're just tools. Uh, and then for me, it's usually to do with language and slipping in large words. You know, I've seen people do them and I sometimes can have them sent back and it's, it's this really large language and it's not pushing through the brief and trying to get to you know, the more I've done this, I didn't study philosophy, but the more I've done this, it's like strategy and philosophy are kind of the same. Like what's the thing in the thing there? And is there something that's, that I haven't heard before? And you start to, uh, there's a book about, oh my gosh, what's it called? About talent. And what the, it talks about, like the people who are, the be, are really good at what they do, they have the, a really simple rubric. They just know how to apply it in a savage way because of their experience and their skills. So for a world-class designer, the word simple or minimal, it means something extremely specific that it wouldn't mean when we're 22, 23, just starting out, for example. So yeah, the, the, the traps are taking all this stuff too seriously and, and not seeing strategy work as creative work and then using words that are expensive and cumbersome. Thanks for the Thank question. you. Great question, Chris. Any other questions, gang? Any other thoughts or questions while we have Mr. Pollard with us? Hey, Mark. Uh, question about um, about the framework and how you use it. I know I know it's one of your go tos, and thanks so much for it. Was really cool to see the process of you kind of going 
going through it with us. Wondering about, um, can you, do you find that you use that framework for kind of big projects and small projects? Like yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how malleable it is because it feels like you could apply that to something small like a campaign, but then also something bigger like a brand positioning. Yeah, I, I would apply it to most things. I would do it before a digital, social, or content uh, strategy. I might do it before something to do with product or UX, although, although I do that work less uh, these days. Uh, I, th I think where it, it needs a little bit of thinking through, and maybe this is a, a trap, is uh, if you're creating a brand from scratch, sometimes, you know, I've got a discussion guide that I, I'll post it at some point on the internet, but maybe I wouldn't go through this. I might spend more, if, if the founder's trying to especially create a business as an act of self-expression, I want to get into their heads more. That'd be like a three hour, uh, three hour interview, for example. And some of this thinking will apply, but often I found the problem statement, not the most useful if they're just starting out, you know, it's, it, I think it, the problem, like identifying a problem starts to become slightly more relevant to a campaign that you would do, but, you know, I think it's, it's all, it's all valid. Thanks. Lovely stuff. Good question, Colin. Any more questions for? Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, what do you do kind of when the brand's advantage doesn't necessarily solve the, the problem? Uh, do you have an example? Like, for example, if the problem is that people are too price sensitive and they don't want to spend too much money, but the brand's advantage is that they have really high quality hearing or something. <laughs> yeah. So I would, the, that problem language, anything, anything that sounds marketing like I would get through and I'd, I'd push us through it. So things like a way language from the path to purchase, awareness, consideration, intent, price for, and value, which I know aren't on the path to purchase, but I, I want to get into their heads. So if they're saying, uh, I'm price sensitive, it's seven o'clock. There's all this noise outside. It must be that cheering that people are doing. Um, if they're saying they're price sensitive, I want to talk to them. Like, why, why do you think it's, it's not good value? And I want to get more, more, what I would call like street language from it and then try to work out how to connect what the product's about. I wouldn't use words like quality. I wouldn't use words like value. There's a whole you know, mini dictionary of language that's in all the marketing presentations, convenience, confidence, joy, empowerment, blah, 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 durability, performance, longevity. You know, it's always like illity and ality and all those kinds of words. So I'm just trying to get through that. And I, I energize the problem so it might feel and sound like a criticism, but in it, it will captivate people and that's how our brains work. We're wired for the problem. So yeah, with that particular example, I'm going into a sharper definition of the problem. If you're in a conservative environment or people don't like the word problem, that's a problem, but also you've got to be careful with that stuff because these are just your thinking tools. You don't have to share everything just as a, you know, as a reason to fight people. Could it be in that case, though, you're just talking to the wrong people that maybe you need to redefine your audience or, or find a different audience? Like if your brand proposition doesn't line up with the, the human problem behind the business problem, maybe you're talking to the wrong humans. You need to redefine your target. Yeah, I, I, you know, when I've done these things in public with people, often we can't be specific because we haven't specified a business issue or an audience. And so I get more specific and sometimes I'll get silly. Uh, so that Drambui example is silly, but I think there's an interesting truth in there. And I've got a creative, there's a creative team at TBWA in New York developing some work for it. And I, I think it could be really interesting and, and good, but I overly defined in a silly way who that audience was so I could get into more of the wild west of, of thoughts. But if we're playing, from that really obvious uh, playbook with that really common marketing jargon. Ugh. I mean, at the very least, someone could jump into it. If you can't pick up the phone, if you can't go talk to people, you know that you can obviously, and I know you do this, jump onto Reddit and look for something that's like a really energetic quote that you could at least play with to get you to a new space. Um, yeah, it's, it's a problem. Like we find clients often will want to talk to everybody because they want to reach the broadest audience possible. Yeah. <clears throat> we try and get them to be a little bit more specific and to, you know, who are the people that yeah, just do, really do you, to appeal to, right? So, do you use the, because there's obviously the concept of a perceptual target. I don't, I don't do you use that one? Yeah. A version of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
yeah, it's really hard if, if, if you're working, if you've got clients who don't want to make any sacrifices and they don't want to be specific, it's, it's difficult because maybe they're not going to respond to brave creative ideas and brave creative thinking. They're just fro frozen, you know, 